what I want to try and rattle through in the next half hour is kind of two talks. I couldn't really pick a title. Um, so on one hand, I'm going to teach you a bit about how I make these. So this is a hand-built electric guitar. Um, and I started doing this a while ago. And I try and do it like I was at Liverpool Make Fest recently. And, and what I try and do is show people how these are made. And I keep getting people coming up to me and go, oh, that's amazing. I could never do that. And that's demonstrably not true, because three years ago, I hadn't set foot in a workshop, and I'm a software engineer, so I have no physical capabilities whatsoever. Um, and so the kind of other title of this talk is From Idiot to Imposter, which is like, I know that I come to events like this, and I hope in the same way that you will get inspired by something and go on to want to kind of action that kind of passion later. But as you leave this place, or you know, either today or after some more of the festival, you get back, you may have hit Amazon and bought some dev boards, that's usually my uh, advice. Um, and then you hit work or looking after family or whatever it is that then you kind of lose the momentum um, the moment things start going wrong. And so with this, this time, I try to structure things to make it more likely I would succeed. And it's kind of, so I want to intertwine those two, two topics. Um, so let's see how it goes. This is an electric guitar, like this one here. Um, it's not the world's most complicated instrument, um, once you get to know it. It's not a piano or a violin or a saxophone or something like that. So it's actually quite a good place to start out with if you want to get into building instruments. Um, it's got a few parts to it. You've got the body, you've got the neck, you've got the electronics that can make it work. But it's, you can, see kind of see the components fairly quickly on a on an instrument like this and that makes it a really good place to start um, so when i got into the idea of i wanted to build an electric guitar i did a lot of research i understood kind of the parts but for my first one i started thank you here with a bunch of parts i kept it at that level of abstraction so a lot of the topics that i want to cover jp's already mentioned so the idea of not trying to do everything all at once, but starting small, iterating. Every time, like every time I try and build a new guitar, I try and go a little bit out of my comfort zone, and I try and keep most things more manageable. So this was me as a software engineer, keeping the, you know, I'm going out of the, my comfort zone because I'm building something physical, but I've kind of simplified the problem a lot by cheating. I just bought a bunch of parts, and I'm, you know, I'm just going to cheat and try and get to some sense of achievement quickly. I'm going a little bit out of my comfort zone, as I say, because I'm doing some physical stuff. This body I bought was the cheapest one I could get. I knew it would need a little bit of woodwork. And I figured that I'd keep that bit manageable and try and start on that path. But overall, I'm trying to keep things kind of simple. Um, the other kind of advantage of doing this, obviously, is I've not spent a huge amount of money on bespoke custom loofery tools and very exotic woods. So if I get to the end of this and it's a disaster and I actually discover that my passion's making kilts or art house films on souffles, then I can change, right? I've learned something, I can move on, and that's fine. Um, so having assembled this kind of pile of parts on, on the kitchen table, um, I need somewhere to, to, to kind of enact. I don't have much kind of, you know, I don't have room to do woodwork at home. Um, the, this here is Cambridge Makespace. So it's a community workshop, or a makerspace, or a hex space, call it what you want to. Um, there's lots of these around the country. There's one even in Hebden Bridge, I believe, Bridge Rectifier. Um, there's one over in Liverpool called Does, which I occasionally go and visit. And these are great spaces. And you go there for the workshop because there's space, they have, you can't see it off here, there's a woodworking kind of facility where they have a bunch of tools that I can use. Um, but they also have some laser cutters, some 3D printers. There's a glass kiln over there. There's an electronics bench. There's some sewing machines off here. There's lots of kind of tools. And that's kind of why people sign up and go for this, because they see all the toys and think, oh, that's awesome. But I choose the word community workshop um, deliberately, because the community is half of why you want to be here. I couldn't do this if it was just I had access to tools, what I need is access to experience. And I didn't realize that when I joined up, but that's, this is what it, what's important is all these people you can see here, the members, they all know stuff that I don't know. And none of them build guitars. 
right? Not, not that I'm aware of. Um, but they all do makery stuff. So there's a guy at the back there on the electronics bench. He probably knows how to solder better than me, and I'm gonna, obviously going to have to learn how to solder electronics at some point. So I can, you know, in exchange for helping him with one of his projects or a beer or just out of, you know, people just do it because they want to help. Um, being in an environment like this where there are other people is just a huge key to succeeding. So if you, whatever it is you take away that you want to get passionate about, trying to find a community to be a part of, be it physical or virtual, um, you know, just surrounding yourself by other people moving forward in whatever it is they're doing is great. And over time, I slipped from being in that 80% that uh, JP was referring to. When I, I signed up to make space, I didn't really go that much. I thought it was a good idea. It was like a gym. You felt good about it, but never where I went. Um, to now I'm kind of slipped into the 5% because I've got the time to help. I'm more active. I kind of help improve the workshop. And over time, that will wax and wane, right? And as workloads change and things. But it's, it's yeah, being part of a community is, is hugely important. Um, so yeah, I got these people to teach me how to use like a pillar drill and it's even the unobvious stuff. So as a software engineer, I thought there were two types of screwdriver. There was the one with the minus sign at the end and the one with the plus sign at the end, right? That's, that screwdriver's covered. It turns out there's more. Um, and just being in a place with more experienced people, I remember someone coming up to me and saying, Michael, that's, that's the wrong kind of screwdriver for that. So it's not even proactively seeking help, just surrounding yourself by people who more experience than you know, of a positive attitude. Um, so through that, kind of, you know, I took the body, I learned how to cut some holes in it and put some other holes in it there. I made my first guitar. Um, does this make me a master Luthier yet? No, clearly not. Um, does it matter? No, uh, not, not in slightest. This is still the guitar I play most days when I do my morning practice. This is here my seventh guitar. This is all kind of hand built and kind of, you know, kind of old grand, but this is still a guitar that I made because I wanted a guitar that made a particular noise and so it does the job and I still play it every day. If I hand this to someone who's a guitarist, they'll, they will not start questioning, wait a minute, didn't you just cheat and buy? They don't care, it's a musical instrument. So in taking those baby steps, you know, you can achieve things and kind of start to see your progress and, and measure them a kind of not in a, I want, I want to grasp, but just having checkpoints. If you set yourself a very grand ambition, it's hard to see your progress. It's hard to work out what's going on, particularly when it all starts going wrong, as it inevitably will. Um, so that was guitar one. Um, and yeah, so, so let's delve down slightly. So the electronics and electric guitar are fairly dumb, right? So the, Notionally, I did two years of electronics at university, and I've forgotten pretty much all of it, um, which is okay, because I say that I don't need to understand much here. You've got, on an electric guitar, you have kind of, this one has two pickups, and these are essentially um, a bunch of magnets with wire coiled around that detect the vibration in the strings and turn it into a small, very small current. You then have, optionally, volume and tone controls, which are just resi variable resistors. Um, and I've got a selector here that lets me change between them. But ultimately, I could have just one of these and a jack to connect the cable to, and it would work, and it would be playable. And if you get many cigar box guitars, that's all they put in them. Um, so there isn't much 2D electronics. Um, this is a quite complicated wiring. It's got 10 components, right? And most of the like, um, one of the big pickup manufacturers called Seymour Duncan has on their website pretty much all the, op all the circuit diagrams. So I don't even have to sit and figure them out. I can just go to the Seymour Duncan's website and say, oh, it's got two pickups and three controls or whatever, and it will generate the circuit diagram for you. So you don't need to kind of have a great in-depth of, and this will be true of most domains, right? You try and focus on the bit that's interesting to you and kind of push the others to the side. So like the pickups, I really would like to mine my own pickups because it sounds, Interesting, right? There's some kind of magic here. You've got a bunch of magnets. You vary the amount of wiring you do, and you get a really different sound. How cool is that? Um, but it would be a total rabbit hole, and I would never learn to do woodwork if I did that. <laughs> and I've made a very conscious decision to stay away from this, um, as cool as it seems. Um, 
I'm learning enough. And I, I, again, it's very tempting to go down every rabbit hole you come across, right? Um, I make most of this, but I, did, I was tempted to try and do metalwork to make the bridges, because I don't make those. But again, that would just be a total distraction. And that's okay if that's what you want to do. Go down that rabbit hole, but just acknowledge that you can't do everything. So if you're going to go and wind pickups or you know, make sporans for your kilts that you're making, maybe just focus on that and do a good job of that and kind of outsource the rest. I'm fortunate I know a chap in Chester who makes pickups and I get, you know, I work with him and can outsource that bit. Uh, the, the body. So the body on electric guitar is what most people kind of look at. It's the bit that differentiates it most from other guitars, kind of in a immediacy sense. Um, on a typical solid body electric guitar like this, it's the bit that matters the least. Right, it's the bit that you focus on, and that's why, because we can do all these kind of funky designs and stuff, because it doesn't really matter. It just has to be a thing that bolts everything else together. And so it's a good place to start with my next guitar, right? I bought all the bits for the first one. For the second one, I'm just going to make the body, and I'll still buy all the bits. So I'm still iterating, keeping it simple, going a little bit out of my comfort zone each time. Um, so I got people in the MakeSpace community We'll do teaching sessions on, on, on different bits of kit. So I attended one on the CNC router, which is a computer controlled wood cutting machine, essentially. Um, I downloaded a design off the internet for the guitar, so I cheated again. Um, it looks very much like the design for the last guitar, deliberate. I'm keeping it, I'm trying to make sure I understand what success looks like, right? So if I try to design a really wacky guitar on my second one, I put it together and it's slightly wrong. Well, what bit did I get wrong? I don't know. Whereas, in fact, all these guitars at this point look like the one I bought at university. So I, <laughs> I have this raft of guitars that all look the same, but it's deliberate because I know I can then assess whether they're good or not. Or kind of, or, and kind of understand, again, when they go wrong, as they inevitably do, where the, where the mistakes are. So, so yeah, at the end of it, I have a nice like, body for, for, for this guitar. Um, and yeah, did I cheat again? Yes. Am I a master Luthier at this point? No. Does it matter? I, I, I don't think so. Because um, I've made progress. I've learned. I'm moving forward. And at some point, this guitar was for my brother. And he was over the moon at this kind of beautiful bit of kind of wood that was unlike other guitar bodies he'd seen. Um, the wood was cheap off eBay. Um, so the bodies, again, you can, you know, again, it's, it's less scary making the body because if you get it wrong, it doesn't really matter you can kind of smooth out that divot that you took out and, and, and kind of no one really knows. The one bit you have to get right is the fret positions um, on, on the neck. So these are the, the frets. Um, so this is a guitar. Um, this here is the scale length. So the thing that's kind of important on an electric guitar is this is your nut and here is the saddles on your bridge. This is called your scale length. Um, on this guitar, it's 24 inches. On the previous guitars, it was like 25 and a half. A bass, a bass guitar is just the same, only it's a longer scale length. So they are like 32 inches. Um, baritone guitar, kind of 27 inches. A ukulele, somewhere down here. I don't actually know the number. But ultimately, they're all working on the same principle. You're just varying the scale length. <sighs> um, I'm not sure how many people were prepared for this. I probably should have put a warning up that we were about to do a gear shift from woodwork to uh, JavaScript. Um, as I said, I, I'm a lab software engineer. Um, how, how do you work out where the frets go? It's actually not that hard. It's only this line here that really matters in all this. And if we look at the, this math.power is just like doing powers. So you can do that on a pocket calculator, right? Two to the i divided by 12, where i is like one, two, three, four, right? Um, we've got a divide and we've got a minus, and we know the scale length because we've measured the point from here to here. So that means if you're building a guitar, it doesn't really matter what the number is here, but once you've worked it out, if you sit down with a bit of paper and a pocket calculator, you can just do this, kind of take you 15, 20 minutes, whatever, and you can work out the position of all these, right? So again, even though you need to know this number, and these frets have to be accurate relative to that, it's not rocket science to work it out. I'm as I say, I'm a computer scientist and inherently lazy, so I write a web page to do it for me. Um, so these numbers here are just calculating the positions for a 25 and a half inch scale length guitar. And 
you know, it's, I found out that other guitar builders are lazy as well because a bunch of people now use this tool that I wrote for myself, which is a nice way of being able to kind of give back, bringing some of my expertise from my domain to bear on the kind of thing I've taken up means that you often have a different view on what it is you're doing or a different approach. And I'm not exactly the world's best luthier, but I've been able to help other luthiers, which is kind of cool, I think. Um, uh, as an idiot, I'm helping other people, so it's good. However, for the, for the um, first time I did the frets, I cheated. I bought a neck without frets, and I just put them in. The reason I did this at all was because for Guitar 2, my brother wanted gold kind of hardware on the guitar, um, on the grounds, presumably has no taste. Um, but <laughs> the, if you look at most uh, guitar necks, they'll have silver, uh, sorry, not silver, uh, stainless steel or nickel frets. And I, I wanted gold fret wire for this. My brother, that's the gold hardware, damn it, who's going to get it? And so I found somewhere that did kind of gold alloy and did the frets myself. Um, this was really stupid on my second guitar. I broke my own rule here. Um, so to do the frets, you cut this wire up into strips and then you hammer them into the slots. Um, that's a bit annoying because the slots are really narrow and, and ultimately you're trying to kind of press them in while hammering, so they don't really want to go. So this takes me like, you know, a couple of hours or something. Um, however, because you've hit them with a hammer, they're not all flat. They're all kind of up and down. And if, you know, the... the so as I'm sliding my finger, the note only changes when I hit a fret, right? So it's the fret that's defining the note. And if, if this fret was too low, instead of getting that, I might get that note, which would be sad when you're in the middle of your you know, rock god moment on stage and you ring out the wrong note because I've messed up the fretting. So I have to you know, masking tape up the fretboard, I take some straight edged files and I file all the frets down. Um, that takes a bit of time. However, these frets, which are nice and round when I bought the wire, are now flattened. And so as I do that, there's a kind of, if, if they're not round, my finger will stick. And again, I'll not get the nice, the kind of slide I want. So I have to take more files and round, round the fret back over. Um, I really hate this. Um, yeah, and, and then obviously, because all the sandpaper here is because, you know, having um, filed them, if I do that, you'll hear the string scratching over the fret. Um, and that would be sad as well. And so all in all, it takes me two working days. Now this is a hobby, a side, like, for, you know, when you take up these kind of things, it is the thing you do when you're not at work or looking after your family or, you know, a combination of the two or whatever. So a working day is what's that for most of us. It would be, we'd be lucky if that was a week of hobby time, right? So if this has taken me two working days to do, that's probably taken me a couple of weeks to get to this stage. I hate doing this because uh, I'm not a patient person. And in fact, so the, I found in prep, I found this picture of the, my brother's guitar strung up. And I now just reel in. These are all not rounded off. That, that's not nice. They're too high. It's dreadful. And I know it's dreadful because I had to do it three times to get it right. And this nearly broke me as, you know, it says, like, I just can't get this right. I've committed to do it, and it's just going wrong. And um, yeah, it, it took me, I think the first picture I've got of this is like November. I think I finally got it done in January. Um, but the thing that kept me going is the guitarist for my brother, he asked me to make it for him, having seen mine. Because he's not paying for it, he just, you know, I, I'm doing it because I want to, uh, an excuse to do stuff. But I said to my brother, I will deliver him a guitar. So I have someone out there who hopes I will succeed, right? Um, and the thing that kept me going when after the second time, another two weeks has gone and I've still not done a good job and it is not an instrument, it is just a bit of sculpture at that point. And why am I gonna spend another two weeks doing it? It's because there's someone who hopes I'll succeed out there. And that's something I encourage you to find in whatever it is you try your hand at is, I, I use the word customer but I don't mean customer, I just mean someone who's engaged with what you're doing. Uh, I write a blog every week of things that have gone right and wrong. And part of the reason I do that is, again, like people expect me to have done something every week, no matter how small. So when it's all overwhelming and I'm looking at this thinking, I can't do this again, it encourages me just to do a little bit each week and just move forward a little bit so I've got something to write in my blog. So it's kind of finding that structure where 
there are people out there who can, who are kind of willing you to succeed. And, and finding that could be signing up for a show, could, again, taking part in a community. Anything that helps you externalize that kind of desire to succeed. Um, and it's worth it because this is my brother uh, on stage at King Tut's Wawa Hut in Glasgow. Behind me are like 200 people having a blast. And in all my life of shipping software and making things, this is the most proud and happy I've ever been. Right? I was in a venue that I used to go to when I was an undergraduate, and there's everyone's having a blast. And in some small way, I'm a part of that. Um, and so that kind of persistence pays off. But I would have given up had it not been for my brother, because I, I would have gone and done something else. Um, cool. The neck. The frets sit in the neck. Um, the neck is the bit that is, like, with the frets in, is the bit you have to get right. It's the bit that no one looks at or thinks too much about. But it's the bit the musician interacts with. And the neck is frustrating in the way that you put it together. Um, so you start with a plank of maple in this case. You kind of cut off the bits kind of from the side. There's the thing in the middle called the truss rod. Who's seen a truss rod before? Um, this here is the metal rod that goes inside a guitar neck. And the nice thing about it is it's adjustable. So if I twist at the end, you can come and have a play if you can't see it. It bows out in the middle. Um, the strings, when you put the strings on a guitar, will try and pull the headstock around this way. And there's about 50 kilos of pull there. Um, so this is giving some rigidity, but it's also adjustable because different strings will require different kind of balance. And so that's how you control the action of the strings above the frets. And kind of, if you are ha unhappy with your guitar because the strings are too high or too low, a small, like, like an eighth of a turn at most on the truss, uh, truss rod adjuster is, will, uh, will, will kind of move you in the direction. So something to uh, keep in mind. Um, most people are just scared of adjusting it because they're worried they'll snap the neck. So, but it's fine as long as you do minute adjustments. Um, anyway, so I've cut this out. I've put that, and that's like another half working day again. So, you know, a significant time. You glue it up with the fretboard. Um, oh yeah, this. Remember, I did this. Um, the good thing about being in a workshop that, right? The bad thing about being in a community workshop is it never has exactly the right tools you want, or if it does, they're blunt. Um, um, however, you know, there are upsides to being a community workshop beyond just the people themselves that make it worth persevering. One is you have tools that other people don't necessarily have. So in addition to calculating the positions in this table up here, I have this button over here that says generate DXF or SVG. So I can actually take this and put it onto the laser cutters at MakeSpace. And so I, I, I'm not like a caveman with a pencil and a ruler. I put the entire neck into the laser cutter and just say, etch me a line where I should cut the frets. Um, I can't use the laser cutter to cut the frets because the channel it makes is a V shape. I need a kind of straight edge. But it, it saves me. I've got a friend who, who makes guitars professionally. It takes him like an hour, hour and a half just to mark out the frets to soaring time. It takes me two minutes. And that's because I'm in a workshop which has all these fun toys. So look around and find you know, what you can uh, turn to your, you know, it might not be the perfect tool, but you can uh, bend it to your will. So then I'm doing all these actions from here on in where I'm removing material, and that's terrifying. Because you're investing time in this thing. There's some money as well, but it's mostly time that's precious. So I keep kind of spending half days here and there, and every time I touch it, another half day to do this. Oh, I'm rounding off the, I cut the headstock shape out. Um, I have to drill the inlays. Every time I touch this, I'm removing material, and there's one good outcome, and an infinity minus one, uh, <laughs> bad outcomes. And it's terrifying. The tent, like, so how do you do the back of the neck? Well, you just take a brutal rasp and remove the bits you don't want. Um, I procrastinated about six weeks before I did this for the first time. Again, the only reason I did it was because I'd promised myself and I'd said to my parents that I was going to make this guitar for a friend for Christmas and Christmas has a fixed date. And so I created that kind of structure. Um, fixed date in modern times, maybe we should say. Um, so you kind of spend all this time, you, you get to the end. And here's, here's me putting on the tuner, tuners. So I put one in, fine, put the second one in, screw it in, fine, put the third one, screw it in. Oh dear, the head's sheared off. Um, 
to say I was upset at this point, because um, I've just put in all this effort, and, I, and I've, I've just demonstrated that I am the idiot I think I am. You know, all these people say, oh, you're making guitars, you're, you must be awesome. No, I'm an idiot, I, I just a screw, it's just ruined. I spent how long on this? Um, and this is where, again, community plays a big part. So I have a second kind of community, which is Luffy's like Instagram. We just share photos of guitar builds in progress. We kind of like to see what other people are doing. We like to show off. We just like to learn techniques from each other and what have you. And even someone like me, who's a rank amateur, professional Luffy's will follow because I will do weird things like use a laser cutter. Right, so it's kind of... So I post this picture mostly wanting sympathy. Uh, if I'm brutally honest, I felt sad and frustrated and annoyed. I posted this picture. Um, the next morning, I found three professional luthiers from around the world had sent me saying, oh, that's fine, it always happens. Uh, here's what you do. And so I ran back into MakeSpace. I recreated, I'm an engineer, I recreated the scenario, cut off the screws, tried out their techniques, uh, managed to get the screw out. It's patched under where the, the tuner's going to go. That was another thing they told me to do. And this is how you patch wood holes. Like, you know, guitars are probably about 5% toothpicks and glue. Um, <laughs> And it's, it's patching work. And it's because I've shared a negative thing with a community, right? Like, the temptation when you're in part of that community is to just post the positives because you want to look good, right? Well, I think that's natural. I don't know if it's anything to be ashamed of. But it's also important to post your failures because things go wrong all the time. And you're doing two things here. One is you're opening yourself up to people being able to say, oh, no, that's okay. That happens. Here, let me help you. And also you're normalizing the fact that this is... Bad things happen, right? I've not yet worked on a guitar where something hasn't gone wrong. This guitar, which I think looks okay, um, I actually had to patch it where the CNC router tried to break it. And so, right, it, it, but everyone who picks this up and looks at it think, oh, that looks amazing. They don't think, oh, look, yeah, all went wrong there, didn't it, mate? <laughs> right, I mean, you guys are gonna think that now, but, you know, not kind of the rest of the world don't. Okay. This is kind of the last bit, because it's an adjunct to the guitar. We've gone through the body, the neck, the electronics. The amplifier is an important part to your guitar. This amplifier here uh, is the one and only amplifier I've built. I didn't want to build an amplifier, so from that point, it's an abject failure. Um, the, what I wanted to do was build more guitars. However, the way I wanted to get into doing my own designs rather than copying other people's designs was I wanted to learn CAD kind of drawing or kind of the 3D modeling on computer, getting them out to manufacture. And an amp is a box, so it seemed a good first project, right? I, the in, inside the electronics aren't I kind of outsourced that, but the box was what I made first in CAD. So I spent a couple of weeks learning how to kind of design, design the box, how to tell the computer to cut the box out, and then cutting the box out. And I'd encourage you, when you do this, you end up with kind of this box and a finished amplifier. It's always, my goal is making guitars. This was a kind of side, kind of distraction in, on one hand, but it had a purpose. But the thing I'd encourage you to do when you do this is take them to completion. Because I made that look like a linear process, and it's not. Like what happens is you kind of, oh, stop playing, thank you. Um, you draw the box and you think you're, you're good at this now. And then you go to try and lay it out, and then you realize, oh, th this is too tight a corner, I can't do this, I have to go back here. And yada. And then when you try and make it, you realize you can't lay it out on the sheet of wood because the wood's actually not as big as you thought it was. And so you have to go back here. And it's an, so pushing through small projects to completion is always important um, because it will reveal the, the gaps that you would otherwise have missed. And then I was able to draw a guitar, which then became a guitar, right? Um, so this is kind of the rough set of tips. And it, I say, I use the guitar as an example here. Whatever your passion is, whatever it is you leave here inspired with, or wherever inspiration next hits you, these are kind of, this is a structure that I've used to try and help me succeed. Community is a huge part of it, just getting other people to interact with. Um, and again, that's that kind of iterate, do small things often rather than try and do one massive thing. Um, there you go, that's, uh, that's, that's me. We can have lunch now.